Thanks, Eric, and um, uh, thanks for some of the uh, lead-in that you did uh, prior on BD2K, which I will save us a bit of time. Uh, I'll also try and address the question that just came up uh, regarding bib sketch size versus uh, size of the rest of the proposal. I, I, I see that all as part, of, personally, as the changing face of scholarship and what it means to be a scholar in the modern era, and that's something that certainly figures into our thinking as we, we think about this. And I, uh, and I'll say a little more about that. But the basic notion that we've been sort of come to, and I'll describe a little how we got there, is that we're sort of thinking about the NIH now as, um, as much as we can as a digital enterprise. And I'll say a little about what that implies uh, as I go along. But it, it's really the idea in, in general terms that, that it's not 27 individual uh, uh, sort of information silos, but that, that a lot more interoperability needs to occur between them. And in some ways, data and other aspects of the digital world uh, could potentially enact as a catalyst in that, in that process. So that's really the basic idea of what we're thinking. So uh, as Eric already pointed out, we had this report that came out, and, and Lucilla and Jill and, other, and others, uh, uh, who perhaps are not a part of this council per se, uh, were involved in, in that report, and I looked at that before I even thought about taking this job, and I thought this was an uh, absolutely outstanding uh, beginnings for what needed to be done, and uh, we've tried to follow that pretty closely in what we're doing. Um, and those are the sort of major findings there uh, at the bottom, so this idea of having, uh, of cataloging uh, and making accessible uh, the components of this digital enterprise, um, which of course means all aspects of the research life cycle, uh, ranging from initial ideas through initial data that's collected, hypotheses that are drawn, uh, software that's used to analyze uh, and re labeling of reagents, and all, the, all these sorts of things that go in right down the life cycle all to the way to the final dissemination, which of course now is not just in the form of papers, but in a variety of other uh, aspects as well. So uh, how we catalogue and find and use that and make that uh, available is clearly part of this. To do all this in a, in a biomedical research environment that's more analytical than perhaps it was before, clearly training is a, a large part of this, and I'll say a little about these things and what we're doing to address them. Um, and, and then, of course, the idea that someone, uh, it's not that these things weren't going on, um, but the idea that there was a point, a uh, person, an office to sort of deal with this on a, a trans-NIH basis uh, was the idea. And as such, uh, I report directly to Francis Collins as the director of NIH and uh, talk to him uh, every week or two about what, what we're doing and, and get suggestions. As Eric has already pointed out, none of this would have really got to the point where it is without actually the engagement of Eric and, the, and many people in this institute. And uh, for that, uh, that made it all the easier to come here. Um, and I thank them deeply for that. Um, and so I started on March the 1st. Um, and just by way of background, uh, just to say that I came from UC San Diego. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I was actually in the uh, professor in pharmacology, but I also do quite a bit in the open access space. And I was also the associate vice chancellor for innovation. So I, would, I have all these sort of things that buzz around in my head when I think about these, these problems. So over a, the six months that I've been here, uh, we've put together, I guess, uh, I'll show you, talk to many different stakeholders and come up, and including right to the point last week, uh, actually Jill and, and Lucilla were actually on the, we had another uh, meeting last week. I'm not allowed to call it an advisory, of course, but it was a group of people whose input we uh, uh, really appreciate, who came together, a whole series of stakeholders, really helping us move to the next steps. Because in this fast-moving pace, uh, the, the report now that's two years old is, in this world, this, this day and age, is, is pretty outdated. So uh, clearly, uh, a refresh was needed, and we've begun that process, and it will undoubtedly impact what we do uh, going forward, including in FY15. But that doesn't change the overall notion of what we're trying to do, which is really to foster an ecosystem um, uh, of, in between the, uh, within the extramural and intramural communities, uh, between the private sector and the public sector, uh, 
such that uh, you know biomedical research can be conducted in a uh, in a in a way that's con in compliant with this sort of uh, digital enterprise. And of course, the last part there, which is in italics, is actually the NIH mission. So nothing really changes with the mission. It's just from our point of view. Uh, something that's added to help us get there. Um, so just to give you, this is just a flavor uh, of the sort of what makes up this ecosystem and these respective groups. And I'm going to go into a lot of the detail here, but I just want to highlight uh, a couple of, of aspects. Clearly, uh, this discussion goes on across the 27 institutes and centers. I've now met with all of the directors, all the ICs, uh, tried to draw the commonalities that out of the concerns and opportunities that they see to fulfill their independent missions and figure out what it is we can do together. I've also begun to talk to a number of the agencies. Uh, there's clearly in the, 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 and this will be a theme of what I have to say going forward, is that the idea that with, with flat budgets uh, and growing data needs, uh, the more efficient we can be, uh, the better, obviously. The sustainability is something, if anything, that keeps me awake at night. And that kind of sustainability can be uh, more easily achieved by cooperation across agencies. And we've been having a number of discussions. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. And then, of course, there's the, let's just say, the higher levels of government uh, that exist uh, above the NIH within uh, Health and Human Services, and then other branches of government uh, which all feed into this. And where, uh, of course, there are directives coming from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which you know uh, have driven some of these developments. Um, and that continues. So there's now Open Data 2.0, uh, and we meet uh, periodically every month or two, or a couple of months at the White House to actually discuss uh, how things are moving across agencies. And I'll give you an example of how I feel we can benefit from that as well. And then, of course, there's a lot going on with the private sector, and these are just examples. Uh, and then, of course, other organizations, uh, some of them data-driven, like the Research Data Alliance or Elixir in Europe, um, but also PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and the PCORI, PCOR Net, uh, lots of interactions there. Interactions with groups that we don't normally, or in traditionally haven't had quite so much interaction with. Triple C is a computer science uh, group uh, of esteemed computer scientists, CATS, uh, around statistics, biostatistics, uh, the traditional societies, foundations, and so on. Lots of different kinds of groups, and I'll illustrate what we're doing to uh, work with those folks um, in a second. So uh, these are just sort of a set of goals that uh, have sort of come out from all of these discussions. And an example, just one example, of, uh, of what we might do going forward and some of the things we're already starting on. So uh, I'll just pick one out, the first one. So obviously I'll say more about sustainability. But one of the ideas that came up, in fact, Eric had a lot to do with this, was the idea, what do we do going forward? Uh, perhaps we, we need to sort of stimulate different types of thinking around how we sustain the data resources that we're already funding. So one way of doing that is essentially not have these things drop off a cliff. So fund, 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 and then suddenly not fund. But have a model that sort of ramps down the funding with the expectation that new models will be found to either become more efficient through mergers and, uh, and such, uh, or that there's interaction with the private sector. And we could talk much more about what that might mean. So that's just one example. Um, I'll just pick another one at random, integration, so the idea of phenotype homogenization in terms of what we do across, particularly within the institutes. Uh, there are common data elements for describing uh, clinical information in particular that are used, but there's also uh, a lot of variation and that makes any form of interoperability all the more difficult. So addressing that going forward uh, is clearly a need. So all of that's easy to say, but how, how do we uh, get that? When in fact, the, our little group is effectively eight people across all of NIH with uh, full-time folks, with uh, folks across the various ICs, about 100 of them who contribute into BD2K. Uh, and we have significant, uh, at least from my point of view as a former PI, significant uh, extramural funding that we can, we can put uh, to these problems. So that's really what we have as the raw material. So what can we do? So we've organized ourselves around, uh, I guess, five thematic areas. And I'll just say uh, something about it, each of them quickly. 
Um, so sustainability, education, innovation, process, and collaboration are the five. And these are, you know, we had a retreat uh, internally, and as I mentioned last week, we had a, a working group uh, meeting to, uh, to, tr to get further input into all of these things. And I think that was, there was a lot of buzz about that meeting on the social networks. There was been a lot of follow-up uh, around the world, actually, because uh, there were uh, international folks here as well. And I, I'm actually very excited about where this is going. So let me just say one, a few things about each of them to give you a sense of what, we're, uh, what we, we have in the, in the, in the hopper. Um, first one, sustainability. So Vivian, who's a Banazi, who's well known to many of you uh, from this institute, um, and George Kamatsoulis, uh, who did, had a lot to do with the NCI uh, cloud pilots and who's now working at uh, NCBI, uh, are leading an effort to establish what we, we call a commons. Uh, and that's a public-private partnership, and if, I'll give you, give you a sense of what it is uh, in a second. Um, but it's a way of addressing, or at least evaluating, and then potentially addressing this sustainability issue. And I should, I should emphasize from the get-go that what the things that we're proposing to do in the next year and, and onwards are really what I would say are agile. They're small experiments um, where we will actually try evaluate different aspects of what we're intending to see how well they're working. And this is not, we're not building this massive, and first of all, the commons in itself is not a compute infrastructure. We're not building any kind of a massive infrastructure to support this. We're essentially sort of using what's there and trying to get it to work in, in better ways. So an example of that, of course, will be that the cloud computing is of growing uh, importance. So let's leverage what goes on there, but not just with cloud. Let's leverage what goes on in the cloud with what goes on in institutional compute resources, in uh, national labs, in uh, other uh, high performance computing environments, and see what we can do with those things together. But that requires that uh, we think about things a bit differently. So an experiment in that, in that way is if we have uh, essentially uh, anonymized patient information, you know, the idea of that moving into a cloud environment uh, has some connotations. That has been discussed and that step is, uh, is being taken. Uh, and at least it's, it's bubbling up to, uh, for approval. So dbGaP, uh, which is what I'm talking about, will actually uh, be in a, a secure cloud environment. And that will change in some ways uh, how that's accessed. And Vivian was involved with that. And she could say something about that if there were questions. Uh, it also leads to new uh, funding strategies and new business models. And I think the key to all of this is actually the business model piece of it. I think that is what uh, is fundamentally different. But so the commons you can think of as just an environment where elements of this digital enterprise, the research objects, reside. And so to be commons compliant really means just two things. It means whatever research objects go into this environment, they're identified in some way. And the second thing is they have some level of provenance associated with them uh, and possible metadata as well, depending what they are. And just by virtue of those two simple things, uh, it opens up a wealth of possibilities for what can happen with that content. And so that's uh, really the, uh, the idea. And in some ways, the commons is sort of like the internet in, in the way at least I think about it. In that if, we, you know, if I asked every one of you what the internet was, you would t all tell me something different. And yet you all use it every day quite effectively. So the commons will mean different things to different people uh, but uh, ultimate, so it could be uh, a place to collaborate. It could, you, know, you could think about it as an extension of what NCBI does, which is out in the community rather than within the NIH, if you like, and so on. Lots of different ways of thinking about it. But ultimately, it's driven by this serious situation that we have of effectively, we have the why. So OSTP and all these other initiatives, including the genome sharing, data sharing plan that was just released, um, speak to the why of data accessibility, but they don't speak to the how. And what I've learned in Fed terms since I've been here, of course, is this is an unfunded mandate. Um, and this you know, has serious ramifications for, for what we do uh, with different data types. So we don't really have to address the how. We haven't really addressed the how yet. But at the same time, we need to because we want to maintain this end game, which, of course, is all the, the usual things that we do. And there are different 
data types and styles of data within this environment. So there's the long tail. There's all the data that's currently produced in uh, many, many labor laboratories that, you know, suddenly, in principle, the, the data sharing plans are going to say, okay, you need to find a home for that data that where it's going to exist after uh, the, the, grant, uh, the grant is over, or and certainly during when the grant's there. Obviously, what comes out from high throughput centers and, of course, what comes out from uh, clinical research and patient activities. And so, and then within this context, there are different stakeholders and there are different um, uh, ways that we're, through BD2K in particular, that we're, we're hoping to address it in this notion of this commons. And so I'll say just a little more about what that implies. So just to conceptualize what it means, and it's very simplest what, uh, mode, you can think of it as a sort of Dropbox. So suddenly there's a, this commons icon sitting on your desktop. Data sets can, and other parts of the research enterprise can be dragged and dropped into this environment. When you do so, additional uh, information about the provenance and associated with those could be asked for in the same way as happens in a Dropbox environment now. But each of the components of the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, including, for example, the Data Discovery Index, will be expected to essentially find and, and make these things more accessible. So immediately you have sort of things that could potentially happen here. So immediately you could have situations where any of the research objects that are in the commons, how much they're used could immediately be tracked. How, how people comment on them and have, have used them can actually be tracked as well. So it opens up a place to collaborate. And it also, because you can actually figure out in ways it's very hard to do right now. Finding data right now is very hard. Finding good data is even harder. So these are all examples of things that can happen in this space, and we can certainly talk more about that. But the, the key element to this, I think, is the so-called is the business model. So the, the, the slide's less important than the concept. So the, the basic idea is what happens now is we give resources to investigators to buy computing uh, to buy computing. And typically they buy servers, they buy software, and they sit in labs, and sometimes the money that's given is, I just say this as a PI, not to, I'm, pointing a finger, I'm pointing a finger to myself, former PI, uh, it, that money is not necessarily all spent on what it was originally intended for. And secondly, you know, sometimes that, that may not be the most optimal use of that equipment because it sits idle part of the time and so on. So the idea here is rather than, and this is not, an and or, this is uh, something that could potentially be phased in. But the idea is to give credit. So you get dollar credit to compute. You don't actually get the money per se. And then you spend that, those, uh, that credit in a commons compliant resource. So in other words, one of these uh, resources that has agreed to support the commons with those two simple rules that I described before. Then what happens is, uh, on a, and then there's a broker so an investigator will go to a resource that they find the most compelling. So if they happen to do a lot of work where they have lots of data but they don't do much computing, it's more compelling to go to a resource uh, that supports that at a good price as opposed to other researchers who don't have much data but do massive amounts of computing. It drives competition into the marketplace. Then they spend those, they spend those credits at that particular resource of resources uh, those resources actually then send a bill to a broker. The, the broker sends one bill to the NIH. The NIH pays that bill uh, to back to the broker and, and, and the funds are dissipated. So we believe, at least, we want, again, not a big initiative, but to test this out in various ways, that, the, that what we can get for the compute dollar will far outweigh what we currently do, where we spend, uh, it's not clear what we actually spend uh, on what you would call uh, computing right now and, and, and compute infrastructure, but it's certainly well over a billion dollars a year. So if we could spend at least a portion of that funds more uh, to get more compute for the money and potentially open up things that we could do scientifically, which of course is the main point, uh, that would be uh, a huge plus. So I think the idea is to evaluate this in the time to come. What came out of the meeting we had last week and it came out from a group that, was, that had a number of the cloud providers in it, so um, including, for example, Dave Glazer, who's the, um, just one example of the people who were there from a major uh, 
uh, uh, cloud providers, but came up with this idea that, of course, this all has to be done in a virtual cycle. So we need to find, to test this out, we need to find applications that, that scientifically can work within this context, but really have outcomes that are going to appeal to the researcher in a relatively short period of time. So clearly that will have to be the driver for this. You can't, this is not a build it and they will come model. It's basically identifying uh, virtuous uh, applications that, that are motivated, um, produce data and there's associated tools and results and that furthers the motivation. So this is sort of how it has to work. So that's, sorry, I went on a bit about that, so I better speed up. Uh, so that was sustainability. Let's quickly look at some ideas in education. Um, I think the thing, a thing that drives me in all of this, I have to say, is personally, is uh, the notion of what I call the Google bus. So when I was in San Diego, Google did not have uh, an office in San Diego, but they had one in Irvine. And slowly but surely, the folks from my lab were actually finding themselves on the Google bus going up to Irvine every day to work. I could not keep them in the academic system. And I think that was a real disappointment because, yes, I would never be able to do that financially. Uh, I could, we could never compete. But some of those people were not so concerned about finances. They were concerned about being appreciated as scholars. And I would say this class of data scientists is are often underappreciated in academic systems. And this is something that we're working hard to address. It's particularly important if you think about it from how the NIH spends money. If we're spending money training these folks, it'd be really good if they, at the end of all of that, continue to contribute to biomedical research and not uh, something else which might also be worthwhile, but um, uh, you know, it's how we spend the money. So I think there's various uh, things in, in the works to sort of address that, including, for example, which talks about this cross-cutting. We're having a workshop with the NSF where we're actually going to go out and talk to administrators at uh, particularly academic medical centers uh, to sort of highlight to them best practices where these kinds of people are kept in the system. Um, so that's just one example. Um, and then uh, apart from the, the various training uh, initiatives that are going on through BD2K, uh, we're actually looking at a series of other initiatives. One, I'll just highlight one again uh, that, it, that excites me is the idea that there's a mass of online courseware out there. There is a mass of physical courses that one can take. But how do you find them and how do you find the best ones? So one of the discussions we've been having with partners in the EU is the idea that we develop metadata standards to describe these courses. So in other words, that there would be standard descriptions for these things, which don't exist right now, uh, which would, uh, we would do this across various courses uh, in Europe and in the US. And that would you know, increase findability and potential usability. So that's just one example of a series of standards initiatives that we are, we're, we're undertaking. Typically, one thinks about standards associated with different data types. I threw this in here because it's a standard about something quite different. OK, so, and Michelle Dunn uh, is leading that initiative. The innovation piece. Uh, is really the BD2K piece, so it's really how we get uh, the best that the extramural community has to offer uh, associated with, uh, uh, with what we're doing in the world of data science and, and, and furthering uh, the, the mission around um, biomedical research. Uh, Eric highlighted some of these things that, uh, actually all of them are, are being uh, funded, um, and Mark Geyer, who's it's sort of like the Hotel California, you can check out, but you can never leave. So he may have, he may have retired, but he lives on, uh, he lives on in, very way, in various ways, including H3 Africa and uh, BD2K. So uh, I can say with uh, Mark and with Jenny Larkin, who's, who's working on this as well, I would be completely lost without these folks. It's, uh, it's overwhelming to come here and, and figure out how the system works. So they've been enormously invaluable to me, um, and I really appreciate that. Um, so I think the kinds of things we're looking at, and I'm, so Eric mentioned these things, I won't go into those anymore, but just to give you a flavor of where we're thinking of going. First of all, we've been looking at uh, governance models. So we've been talking to the World Wide Web Consortium Group. We've been talking to the Research Data Alliance. How do we 
how do we oversee these various initiatives? The 11 centers we're about to fund, the Data Discovery Index Consortium, you know, how do these all play together? And the new initiatives that will be funded uh, going forward. If they're going to play, if we're going to create an ecosystem, there has to be some degree of non-onerous uh, sort of uh, working together and how we best achieve that. And this is something that this institute obviously has done extremely well over the years. So there's lots of lessons to be learned here. So that's really what I mean by governance model. And then just to give you a flavor of some of the things that are going to happen, just workshops we've identified and agreed to fund this year. I already touched on sustainability, standards. There will be a standards framework. There are already a number of efforts that sort of describe standards that are out there. They need to be coalesced. We need to be figuring out what new standards we need to uh, begin to support. These are not things we decide ourselves. These are things that the community tells us are really needed. So this, 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 uh, the community engagement in all of this is really important. Uh, you know, the, the whole ethics and other aspects of research use of clinical data, I want to really explore that. Uh, how we engage the private sector uh, in the use of clinical data, I'm going to have a workshop around that. Uh, how we begin to use electronic health records more for outcomes research, um, clearly that needs to be discussed. And then, of course, there are these other communities. So uh, the gaming community uh, is very interested in potentially working on problems related to biomedical research. And that's, these are kind of groups that are not t traditionally uh, brought into the NIH fold. So the idea of getting some of these people engaged is, uh, uh, is clearly important. So then uh, process, and I'll, I say this in the context of the questions that were asked earlier about the bib sketch and so on. I think what I mean by process is what we do internally to manage and handle grants uh, and other aspects of the enterprise. Um, so we clearly need more clinical data harmonization. The one thing, as an example, I've been talking about recently, and I presented this to uh, the uh, the, the directors, uh, associate directors uh, within the office of the director. And they've we're now got to go ahead to sort of look at this more carefully uh, and then uh, present it to the IC directors is the idea of really having the NIH support the notion of data citation. So this says a lot. So the, the, the rationale for doing this now is that there's, without getting too technical, there's an extension to JATS, which is a, a form, a format that the, uh, uh, the PubMed and PubMed Central ingest from all of the publishers. There's an extension for that coming this month which supports data citation. So in other words, that we can actually bring, we can cite data in a formal way. It can be presented to a human in a variety of ways, just like a citation of a paper. But underneath that, there's a standard format for that, which means we now have a way of citing data. If the NIH says, uh, we support the notion of, of citing data as a legitimate form of scholarship. That's a huge statement. So if you put a data citation in a bib sketch or in a progress report, uh, not only does that say something, but you can also do something with it because that is resolvable. So we now immediately have a resolution to that point of data. We can find that data. We also have provenance, so we know who is responsible for that data. So it, it begins to elevate and, and value things that uh, traditionally have not been particularly valued. And I have a real personal uh, interest in this because you know, the paper I have, I have a paper that's been cited 17,000 times. No one has ever read this paper. No one. Right? And all it is is a paper about a database. It just recognize why are we recognizing data with a paper when it, the, what's really valuable is the data itself in this particular case. So, you know, that, and there, are, there are many examples of, I'd love to talk about this for ages, but how scholarship is totally screwed up. Let me just leave it there. Um, maybe we could talk a bit more about that because it sort of seemed to be a theme that came out before. So in that context, um, you know, we have data sharing plans already across the NIH. So any grant over 500K direct needs a data sharing plan, pushing that down hopefully soon to all grants. Um, but where it stands today is even, you know, the fact is I know this as again as a former PI until recently, that those plans are not necessarily treated as seriously as they should be. And they're certainly not really evaluated in a formal sense. But there's no reason why they shouldn't be. So, 
you know, it's ironic that we have data sharing plans which are not machine readable in any form. Right? If we could read at least elements of those data sharing plans, we could say that, okay, there's a commitment that some data is going to go into this resource in year two of this grant. Well, that resource could be checked in year two to see for that grant number to see whether, in fact, some data has appeared. So that cycle could be automatically completed. So the idea that, you know, that data sharing plans actually have some teeth uh, could actually be done automatically. So this is, these are all things we're looking at. Uh, I won't go into other aspects of this, but the idea of microfunding, open review of grants, um, and having those grants sitting there instead of going into a black hole when they don't get funded. For certain types of grants, if the, if the, if the PIs were willing, they could be opened up and potentially there might be interest in, from philanthropists and others, uh, foundations, particularly for particular kind of, I'd say, non-competitive data style grants where this might be of interest. Again, some, this, is not, this is something to think about and try. Um, okay, so that's finally collaboration. Let me just say a couple of things about this. So I think the whole notion of public-private partnership with respect but to a variety of different reasons, but certainly sustainability, um, that is, you know, that's something that other agencies, it turns out, I never would have discovered this if I wasn't involved with what goes on at uh, OSTP now, is so NOAA, uh, you know, obviously, well, not maybe obviously, but they have already uh, begun to establish public-private partnerships, you know. Uh, and that is a potential way of feeding resources back into support for the primary data that, from which these other things are built, uh, like the Weather Channel. And so, uh, you know, potentially uh, this is something that we should at least look at. So we're having some joint things with the NSF, um, and I think the, uh, the to two other things I'll just mention, uh, there's a group, uh, HEROES is the health, uh, uh, I forgot, in institute, uh, research organizations, pretty much within the G8. There's about 20 now, and it goes a bit beyond the G8, but uh, of organizations worldwide like the NIH, they get together uh, twice a year, uh, Francis Collins is the chair, to discuss pressing issues that are of, of, of import to all of them. Um, big data has come up. Uh, Actually, before I even started this job last December, I went and talked to this group. I've subsequently talked to the data representatives from all of these organizations, or I'm in the process of doing so. And it's clear that there are opportunities to work together. There's a lot of excitement about learning more about what each of us are doing, what, we, you know, what we're doing well, what we're doing poorly. So that's, I think, an exciting development. And then Elixir is a, a project in Europe that I believe now is around 17 countries within the EU are now signed up and they're developing nodes for biomedical research within the respective countries. Uh, they were at the meeting we had last week. We've already now discussed it just happened today, so it's hot, hot off the presses. There'll be at, uh, at least two working groups to def define uh, aspects of how we could work together going forward. So that's just a sort of example of what we're doing in collaboration. And so I just wanted to give you a sort of brush stroke of things that are going on and I'd much prefer to, if there's any time left, to have a chat uh, about what we're thinking of doing and, and having you tell us we should be doing something else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Uh, <laughs> open for discussion. The one, the one immediate point I made, you said it, but I really want to emphasize this because I, I felt the weight of this when I was acting, and I know it has not let up, it's only increased, is having a point person now at NIH for these external groups to actually have a conversation is, I think, incredibly valuable because previously these things would just slip through the cracks or they would bounce around. There wasn't a central person who could have even the conversations with outside groups, whether other funding agencies, other countries, companies, and so forth. So. I'm sure it's killing you because it was starting to kill me, but I mean, I, it does justify the reason that, that NIH made the right move in creating this leadership position. I do a keynote pretty much every day. Yeah. And it's pretty much, I used to say when I did research, or st I still do research a little at the NCBI, but is I would never give the same talk twice. Now I just give the same talk endlessly with some var variations. So, um, I just think I get better at it, but anyway, that's not. But it's also the phone calls and the yeah. emails and the meetings you're getting invited to. There's just finally the communication channels that didn't exist before. Jill. So, Phil, this, this idea of, of a, um, I'm not going to call it a cloud, a, 
a common, accessible computational resource um, is appealing in a lot of ways. But I would just urge that you all be mindful of and careful about the fact that if you start having people go to different clouds based on the particular thing they're doing and how cost effective it is to do that, we may be getting ourselves into a situation where there's a lot of data replication and data movement of fairly big, quote unquote, data sets a across the, the net. And, and so, you know, there's a certain tension there. I, you know, I understand the attraction of using the most cost efficient method for delivering computation to the community. But there's also something to be said for minimizing the number of times a particular data set is replicated and the number of times it's shipped back and forth between resources. So I, I, I just. Yeah, and I take that as a point. But I would argue, at least in principle, again, and this, this needs to be tested, right? But the idea is that if, if this is more of a common space and you can identify and find data sets, the likelihood of having so much replication is less. In well, other words, I, I, you might I, I, actually go out there and look for a data set this, before you actually generate it yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's highly dependent on the particular project. That's why I think yeah. pilots obviously are useful. But I think it's important to look at, at what, what we all call driving biological projects and different projects because, you know, there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of data generation as well as usage of existing data sets in the coming years. So one has to look at those maybe in slightly different ways. But it also does open up the opportunity to really do things with what I call data level metrics. So if, no, no, you know, you, that if you, it's very hard right now to go and find, first of all, if you can find a data set, to have some sense of how often it's been no, used. No, I, and I by agree, who. and that's a different issue than the yeah. one that I was talking about. I'm just throwing about. that in there because I thought of it. You're preaching to the choir on that point. Okay, we have Eric and then Didi, then Bob and Lucille. We're just going to go right down the row. So, Phil, thank you for the perspective first. I have two questions. One is a member of council, the other is a member of the community. So, the council question is NHGRI over the last decade has done a lot to drive and push the formation of databases, omics databases that have grown and are now integral community resources. And really the question is, as a member of council, is who now basically picks up these databases and helps continue to build them for the good across NIH? Because they're no longer really just serving NHGRI. They're N NIH resources. So that's the first question. Could it part do, and in part because it goes beyond genomics. It started, might have started with genomics, now other things are getting added on. True. So let, let me just do that one first, and then because I'll forget that, that well, I won't forget because it's so it's so damn important. But um, I mean, clearly, you know, this is something. In, in my interactions with the IC directors, I've I've asked them two fundamental questions uh, going around. The first one was, how much are you actually spending on data related to activities? So that's a, you know that's a hard question to answer, and none of them had a particularly good answer. Uh, Eric and, uh, and John Lorsch from uh, GM uh, probably had the best answers, and in fact, we've, that's led to looking at this further. And I'll get to that in a second. And then the second is, well, if you, how much should you be spending? So there's this tension between, you know, how much we, we put in, to, in a flat budget, how much we put into supporting the, the data we already have for effectively for reuse versus new data generation. And so that's, so that's, that's, so that, that, I would say, the dealing with those questions is an ongoing thing, and we're, we're essentially, uh, the, all of the institutes are effectively surveying themselves at this point to actually look that up. The, the second piece of your question relates to, you know, if you, I think it, it's tricky. I mean, none of this is easy, but if I just sort of give specific examples, right, you have model organism databases. Well, I think the, and they exist, you know, as separate entities. Um, and that has certain value. Uh, this is just a personal viewpoint, in a sense. Um, that has a lot of value because the, I think we can't underestimate the, the, the curation and quality that goes into producing data. But then, on the other hand, you know, that if you have to go to different resources and, and access things in a different way, 
to answer questions which become more, you know, more and more prevalent these days because you tend in a translational world not to be using a small number of resources anymore. You tend to flip around for a whole series of resources. Now, one argument, uh, and this actually came up quite independent of what I'm saying at the workshop last week, was the idea that you have these highly curated, let's just call them ob data objects that come from model organism databases, and you, you actually you know, put them into a shared environment and that they're e it's easier to use than what it takes to actually pull things from different resources right now. And maybe you could do all sorts of you know, orthologue discovery and prediction and all sorts of things that uh, are currently hard in the way that we, we, we maintain data. And I say this, from, you, know, you know, it's very hard for me to say this because I actually spent 15 years working with a protein data bank and other resources where we, we did everything we could to support the community. But maybe, you know, it's time that these things were opened up a bit more than they are now. And then the community, or the community question is, we're, we living, we're living in a very confused world with reference to cloud computing or web-based computing at the NIH. It's, I'm involved in many projects like everybody around this table. One is we're rewarded for being innovative and cost-effective for cloud computing. And then, you know, on, on Wednesday, for another project, we're treated like Darth Vader and getting cease and desist emails because we're putting the data on a cloud. And, and I'm wondering what's going to happen to have some consistent policy and procedure across the NIH so we can all take advantage of this great resource. Because I, I have to say today it's extremely confusing as an investigator. Right. I mean, I think certainly it's the, the not trivial job of, uh, of, of our little group to try and help homogenize the, the view, these viewpoints. Um, and I think it's inevitable in, as new, these new technologies emerge, there, there are those who see it as you know, a real advantage, there are those who see it as a real problem. And you know, I think what we need to do, which I like, is why I like these like, virtuous cycles, we need these things to actually work and to work well. And we need to you know, m spread the word that way through success rather than you know, but it takes time, and I, I don't have, I'm, I'd be really interested to hear good, aunt, good ways of, of doing this now, but I, I feel the pain. I, 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 I know because when I talk to different groups, I hear this. Um, but, you know, you, that kind of unification is not, you know, it's not something that can be mandated. It's something that I think grows with the, as the science develops. But. So thank you, and I think you have a lot of really creative ideas, and so it'll be very exciting if you're able to implement them effectively across. Well, this the is the bit that worries me currently: is talk <laughs> is cheap and action somewhat yeah. expensive. But, but I think you're on a good. If I don't come back in a year or two, you'll know it didn't work out so well. But <laughs> so I have just—it's maybe just a logistical question, but you talked about these compute credits and that NIH would pay the bill. How does that work for? universities and investigators when part of their evaluation is based on research dollars in the door? Well, they would still know. be, I mean, it's a question of whether it's direct or uh, whether it's, there's overhead associated with this, of course, but uh, that, that's still, that would still be counted. They would still write a grant and say, I want X dollars for computing, and that would be, you know, that, that they would say, I have a grant that's so much. It's just that that piece of the money would not be given as those dollars, it would be given as credit to spend. So they still count it? It would still count. I mean, I think... Okay, I, I figured it was a logistical thing, but I didn't see how you were planning to do it. I thought you were going to ask a more difficult question, which is, you know, what happens, that, that all this happens and it's working, but then what happens when the grant runs out? Mm -hmm. All right, so what happens, you know, there's no more credit, you know, who pays the bill to keep whatever it is that they've generated? Yeah. Well, that's exactly the problem we have now. And the fact is, we have no good way of dealing with it. So effectively, what sort of seems to happen, and you're all PI, so correct me if I'm wrong, but stuff sort of sits on a website, for, and gradually it, it just ages. I mean, I actually did a very simple experiment once where I went out and you know, there's, a, there's a nucleic acid research publishes all these different databases every year, and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's this thing that's growing like this. I actually went, and, and of course, every one of them has a URL, and it's all open access. So I just pulled all those URLs, uh, and then I went and pinged them. And I pinged them for a period of, of time. 
And what you find is that you get an attrition rate of about 10% a year. So after one year, 10% of those resources are no longer accessible. I mean, sometimes they move and, and you know, it's a little complicated. But, but you know, and then it, it basically drops off 10% per year for five years. So at the end of five years, all those papers that are in the literature are absolutely meaningless. So, you know, so that was a bit of a rant. Um, but then what do you do about that? So, you know, I think the idea that if we had better ways of measuring what was valuable, and this is really tricky, because value is not just how many people use it. It's what it, impact it has on the communities. Mm -hmm. And that's much harder to deal with. We don't even touch that now in, in what we do. We don't know currently how the data that we currently fund is used, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might know that there are so many users in so many countries download so many terabytes. But if you dig in and you look at individual items of data, who's using what, why, when, and how, and what, is that, what are the implications of that? So the idea of this kind of environment is potentially to make that a little, at least slightly easier. The questions are still very hard, but the mechanics become a bit easier because you have access to this stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I even hesitate to bring this up, given this extremely long and daunting list of tasks that you have. But I, I think one of the issues that has come up in my world has been, once you start talking about patient information, is that the local IRBs and the OHRP don't have a clue about what to do about the cloud. And w whether they, they're unaware that, 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 that there actually is security, <laughs> um, such as it is, and I, so I think one of the one of the government groups you're going to need to interact with is going to have to be the OHRP. Yeah, there's there's no question about that, and uh, it's clear. I mean, you say you don't want to add to a daunting list. Well, it's clear that we need extra help with that. So apart from the small group of people, I'm, you know, the intent is to hire one person who's going to be really dedicated to this type of issue. And uh, you know, I. I the other thing that's daunting is that the, the, the types of data that we cover within are so broad that anyone who was coming into this job is not going to have, a, a, you know, understand the spectrum fully. And I readily acknowledge that I have weaknesses, and I, the idea is to fill those holes with real expertise. So, uh, you know, it's, hopefully we can do, you know, we can start addressing this. But it, yeah, I agree, it's a big, big issue. Right. So, uh, with relation to the genomic data sharing, I think that was a great achievement, the, the, the policy. What about a clinical research data sharing, which is, you know, totally needed? We do have technology to protect the data. Uh, and also, I, I think demystifying the, the cloud as a completely public, publicly available resource. There are public clouds, there are private clouds, there are access controls, there's a whole lot of things that can be done. And I think that the time is right for a clinical research data sharing policy. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I, just, I would also give uh, you know, great credit to the, the, the genomic data sharing policy. It has nothing to do with, with me. It was Eric and, uh, and Laura and many other people uh, around NHGRI who made that happen. And it's, um, and it, it's been a very interesting process to watch, and it's, it's, it's to be highly commended. And I think the idea that we follow on with uh, additional ones is clearly very important. In respect to, you know, the clinical data, I mean, I think there are other, I think that it's difficult, but at the same time, there is pressure for this. There's increasing pressure, as you know, in various ways from your own, what you do yourself, but also, I mean, we heard a lot about it at the meeting last week. And, you know, and, I'm also thinking that, from my own naive po point of view in all of this, just that the, there's a cultural change going on. And I would, I've, the way I put it is, for the first time in history, in my view, the pa healthcare is becoming patient-centric. That the patient has much more control and understanding of the information related to their healthcare than they have had before. And I think there's a question of whether and how we can leverage that in this kind of uh, environment. So there, you know, there is there are talk of various types of you know, co large cohorts where patients are actually taking their healthcare records and, in an anonymized way, 
putting them into uh, a resource that could be used for, uh, for research. Of course, this is already happening in some uh, countries that have, you know, that have social, particularly, I guess, I just picked those that have socialized medicine. I mean, we, we, you know, we know what's going in parts of Europe, and you know, one of the discussions we had with the Elixir folks, and one of the work, workshops we're going to have in short order, really is to, is to specifically address this. Can we create an international cohort that uh, would be accessible uh, in, in this way. And of course, there's oodles of questions around doing that. But if the, if the, you know, if the consent is coming from the patient themselves, uh, initially, it sort of seems to me that it's at least a, a step, big step in the right direction. So Phil, uh, thank you for that. And I just wanted to, to say that um, your comments on the need to recognize the contributions of data scientists and the need to have, um, you know, access to, to data sets that are published be recognized in, in at least a similar way that publication acknowledgments are recognized for career path development. Many of us in this room have been, have been talking about this within our own institutions um, because we need to recruit and retain these individuals. So I think having Having your voice added to that is going to help us and make put into effect some of these changes uh, in the culture of academic uh, advancement much easier. So thank you for that. Um, I would say before you, I, I have a real passion for this because I was one of those people, I, and yes. I didn't necessarily want to take the path that I took uh, to do what I wanted to do. But in the end, you know, I had to become a tenured professor to do what I really wanted to do. Exactly. No, oh, it's very, very important. Um, and then a very specific thing is on sort of you mentioned a couple times the common clinical data um, elements under your common data elements umbrella, the clinical data. So how do you how do you plan to get sort of the input from the community on what those would look like, and how how do you envision engaging with a broad sector of the community on that particular project? Well, I mean, I think in general terms, these communities are emerging. I mean, I just this morning I was on a call with the Global Alliance for Genomic Health, right? So it's clear that's got a lot of momentum. Uh, many of us in this room have been engaged with them in one way or another. Um, and, you know, it, it's the, that, that's, these are important developments. And I think, we, you know, there are, there are several other of these sorts of organizations that really, in a sense, are doing these things for themselves, but they need assistance and what's interesting is this is these are often things in my mind at least that don't actually cost large amounts of money because the community is already in, in but it needs it needs something to catalyze and I you know so I think looking for those kinds of wins in a general sense with respect to you know these the common data elements associated with, 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 with clinical research uh, I mean some of that is sort of going on already I mean NCI is collecting these on behalf of a uh, number of institutes uh, and, you know, both from an intramural and an extramural perspective. Um, and I think if I had more cycles, I would have looked at this more already. But I think it's something that uh, is, is working, but I, it's a question of whether it's working optimally. And I think, you know, having someone to look into this specifically is, is what I was thinking, but I'm open to other ideas. Well, I just, I just think that there's a big appetite for this now. So many of us who are now developing information systems around these data, if they're, you know, where do we go to find out what the current standards are so that when we build the infrastructure, it's going to be integratable with other groups. I mean, that, that's the challenge we're facing right now. We have to make a decision now. And so knowing where to go uh, to find out what the developing standards are would be incredibly useful. Right. I mean, certainly the Office of the National Coordinator and, and their efforts are something we're trying to wrap our heads around as to what is being contributed. And um, I think the idea of having these workshops was specific this coming year is specifically to do that. So all of us data scientists, I think we have to thank you for being the Lorax who speaks for the trees. Um, but you know, I, I think that um, the attribution for, for data and the use of other people's data is very important. Um, I also think we have to be more 
out there about the attribution of people's software tools, some of which may just be a little R tool library or something like that. And, you know, having had my first data set published in the new Nature Data Journal, right, I, I, I almost think that one has to engage journals to have journals begin to recognize the importance of papers citing the software that they use. And I know that you're thinking about software identifiers and so on, but it's one thing to have an identifier. It's another thing when a reviewer is looking at a paper, when a journal editor is looking at a paper or the final copy editing of that paper to really say, okay, you say you did this analysis, what software did you actually use? And cite and give credit to that person. And it's just as important for large software packages as it is for the script that's you know, written and available from a postdoc or a graduate student. So, yeah, so just another Lorax moment here. Yeah, no, I mean, so, you know, Vivian, uh, was leading a workshop on uh, what we were doing with software, and there's a report that's all this stuff. That's another thing I should say, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. So almost everything we do is tweeted, is on social network, Google Docs and what have you, and you can comment on them. Um, so, you know, I, certainly the sentiments from that, uh, that group was exactly what you just described vis-a-vis -vis software, and we clearly have to, to take care of that. Um, just the, another comment you made regarding uh, publishers. So again, you know, I live half of my time in a dream world, but you know, just last past week I had a conversation with folks at the Public Library of Science. So um, I, for those who don't know, I actually found one of the PLOS journals and I've done quite a lot with them over the years. And we talked about the idea of effectively uh, a micro-publication. So this is just, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but there's there's a willingness to test this sort of thing where, in other words, you effectively, you know, you write a piece of software to do the research. Well, effectively, you actually publish that at the time. You get some form of PLOS uh, attribution for that, uh, and it sits there. Of course, immediately other people can use it, uh, and it's accessible. And then as you use it to, you know, essentially farther down the research life cycle of what you're doing, that the results of that and even the data associated with it also get micro attribution and so you're kind of building the publication as you go along and at the same time of course all of this stuff is available you know on one hand it leads to competition potentially on the other hand it leads to collaboration so you know I mean I think it's it's a time in history to really try these things out and 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 then of course measure exactly whether they succeed or fail I and mean, in a small way, as you, as you know, anyway, we've done a number of these experiments with PLOS. A few of them have been very ex ex successful, and a few of them have tanked. So, you know, I think it's, it's trying and moving forward. Okay, I'm going to step in here. I, we probably could talk to Phil all day because of the great interest and relevance to this council, but uh, he'll be back, I'm sure, and more importantly, this council will be regularly updated about all these things uh, because there'll be so much interaction between Phil's organization and NHGRI. So thank you, Phil, and thank you for counsel for the excellent discussion. So Rudy. You, you've earned lunch, but let's try to be uh, quick about this. So um, hoping that the throughput upstairs can uh, meet the demand here, let's try to get back by, uh, let's say, 115. Okay? Well, we'll aim for that. But we'll aim. We'll aim for that. Thank you.